Okay, I'm going to talk about Sikhsu today, and I love Helen Sikhsu and the Laugh of the Medusa. Her argument is directly in response to Lacan and Freud and typical male version, boy version psychoanalysis. And she's writing against the way that woman has been imagined in psychoanalytic theory. She be, and I find this essay thrilling. I hope you really like it. Also, second essay we've read written by a woman. She begins by saying, I shall speak about women's writing, about what it will do. Woman must write herself, must write about women and bring women to writing from which they have been driven away as violently from their bodies. And what she means here is that women must write themselves as in opposition to the way that Freud and Lacan have written or constructed women. Freud and Lacan, especially Lacan, puts language in this phallocentric realm that would exclude women from writing, or at least from living comfortably with language. She wants us, those of us who identify as women, or who would have done so in 1975 when she's writing this, to work against that. She writes um, halfway through, I think it's the third paragraph on the top left-hand side of 989, um, in the middle of a sentence, there is at this time no general woman, no one typical woman, what they have in common, I will say. What she means there is that there isn't woman, this like general woman, uh, but that there are women. And she's going to talk about what women have in common, not pretending that there's a universal one, but arguing that all women, and again, I'm using this as people who identify or would have identified in 75 as a woman, have things in common. And that's what she's going to talk about. She then goes on in that same paragraph to say, um, but what strikes me is the infinite richness of their individual women's constitutions. We can't talk about a female sexuality, uniform, homogenous, classifiable into codes, any more than you can talk about one's unconscious resembling another. Women's imaginary is inexhaustible. She means imaginary in the Lacanian <gasps> sense. So Jameson's playing Minecraft, um, which is very structuralist. Um, if you take the orders that Lacan lays out, we have the real order, the imaginary order, and the symbolic order. And if women can't enter in the symbolic order the way Lacan says that men can, women can live in the imaginary order. And that imaginary order is inexhaustible, that that's not limited the way Lacan would have it be. Further down that page, at the bottom of the left-hand side of 989, she says, I wished, that the, I wished that that woman would write and proclaim this unique empire so that other women, other unacknowledged sovereigns might exclaim, I too overflow. My desires have invented new desires. My body knows unheard of songs that women writing women can inspire and in fact create this, um, I mean, in the most banal sense, this sort of tradition of women's writing that can also bring women's imaginary into the fold um, in a way that allows for women to overflow. So if women are stuck in the imaginary order, there's this overflow into language that doesn't depend on this phallus in the symbolic order. Um, and I'm going to get to what she means by overflow in a few minutes. It's cool. On the top right hand side of 989, she says, where is the ebullient infinite woman who immersed as she was in her naivete, kept in the dark about herself, led into self-disdain by the great arm 
of parental conjugal phallocentrism hasn't been ashamed of her strength. That's a reference to Freud. Conjugal, um, parental conjugal phallocentrism is one of the ways that Freud talks about getting through the Oedipal complex so that you don't become neurotic. And she's saying um, uh, women who are told this story might become ashamed of their strength, that you learn that you are inadequate, that I am inadequate. And then she keeps going, right, right, at the bottom of 989. Right, let no one hold you back, let nothing stop you, not man, not the imbecile capitalist machinery in which publishing houses are the crafty, <laughs> obsequious relayers of imperatives handed down by an economy that works against us and off our backs, and not yourself. Don't let yourself hold you back. Smug-faced smug readers, managing editors, and big bosses don't like the true texts of women. Female sexed texts, that kind scares them. She's suggesting that we not, we haven't gotten to Marxism yet, but that we not be trapped by the material um, uh, requirements of getting published, but that we write our bodies for the sake of doing it. Okay, on, the, on page 990, on the left-hand side, she has, um, she has this um, metaphor about darkest Africa, and we can talk about that in class because it actually is quite troubling. Um, but what she means is that um, woman has been treated as dark and mysterious, which again is troubling. So we'll talk about that in class. Um, uh, but just to continue for now, on the top right-hand side of 990, she says, um, uh, well, no, halfway through, she says, our glances, our smiles are spent, laughs exude from all our mouths, our blood flows, she means literally menstrual blood, and we extend ourselves without ever reaching an end. We never hold back our thoughts, our signs, our writing, and we are not afraid of lacking. The lacking that she means is castration, that we're not afraid of castration. Um, and that we, in fact, um, uh, smile, laugh, bleed, and uh, and write and speak, and that those are ways in which women um, exude instead of just being absent, castrated. Okay, on the right-hand side of 991, right after the break, on the left-hand side, forgive me, nearly the entire history of writing is confounded with the history of reason, of which it is at once the effect Writing is the, reason is the, uh, the support and one of the privileged alibis that writing and reason have gone together. It has been one with the phallocentric tradition. It is indeed that same self-admiring, self-stimulating, self-congratulatory phallocentrism that if writing and rationalism are linked in this patriarchal order of phallocentrism, then it is self-congratulatory, self-stimulating, and she means that in a titillating way, that it's titillating, and self-admiring. And that's the history of writing that she wants to work against, that phallocentric tradition. And then she says this beautiful thing about only the poets. Um, poetry involves gaining strength through the unconscious. Um, okay, so then she gets to the, her numbered sections. On the bottom of 991, she's talking about Freud again. Individually, she says, okay, by writing herself, woman will return to the body which has been more than confisc confiscated from her, 
which has been turned into the uncanny stranger on display. That women's bodies are somehow uncanny because women's bodies are like bodies that castrated and that creates the fear of castration that shows up in the uncanny and uncanny texts. This is exactly out of what we read from Freud. Um, in number two, she's talking about Derrida and Lacan. This is on page 992. An act, that, an act that will also be marked by woman's seizing the occasion to speak, hence her shattering entry into history, which has always been based on her suppression. To write and thus to forge for herself the anti-logos weapon. Logos or logocentrism, if you recall from Derrida, is this desire to find a transcendental signified and a uh, signified that will um, fix language. Derrida calls that the trans, uh, the uh, anti-logos, logos is the desire for that. To become at will the taker and the initiator for her own right in every symbolic system, that's Lacan, in every political process. Okay. So she's talking again about wresting language from this symbolic order that would exclude women from it. On the bottom right hand side of 992, she writes, and I'm mentioning this just because it's beautiful and I mentioned it briefly before, there is always within her at least a little of that good mother's milk she writes in white ink, woman for woman, woman for women. Um, women write in white ink because of breast milk and that isn't like people can't see the white ink, but it's in contradistinction to the black ink that men would write in, that women have this whole other way of writing. Okay. Um, Um, I'm going to skip down through, she talks a lot about mothers and what she means by that is that women, um, not specific mothers, but that women have this tradition of women or a community of women and specifically the ability to become mothers. She says, uh, that whether or not you have kids doesn't matter, that women's bodies are able to make people and have been made by other women. Okay. On page 994, um, uh, she talks about at the bottom left-hand side, um, bisexuality. She says, in saying bisexual, hence neuter, I am referring to the classic conception of bisexuality, which squashed under the emblem of castration, fear, and along with the fantasy of total being, though composed of two halves, would do away with the difference experienced as an operation incurring loss as the mark of dreaded sectility. She wants to encourage men and women to embrace bisexuality. And what she means by that isn't what we mean by that. What she means by that is that women and men both embrace their other selves, their other halves, so that men, neither men nor women are lacking or, feel, or excluded. It's important, and I'll get to this in just a second, that she um, uh, involves men in this argument. Um, uh, so on the top right-hand side of 994, bisexuality, that is one's location in self, repérage en soi, of the presence, variously manifest and insistent according to each person, male or female, of both sexes, non-exclusion either of the difference or of one sex. 
non-exclusion is what she's talking about. I'm not going to exclude the masculine parts and men don't need to exclude the feminine parts. And then she goes down and talks about penis envy. But then she also, she says, I'm going to read this because it's long uh, and I'm not sure I can summarize it properly. Um, halfway down the page. As a woman, I have been clouded over by the great shadow of the scepter, and that means the phallus, and been told, idolize it, that which you cannot brandish. But at the same time, man has been handed that grotesque and scarcely enviable destiny. Just imagine of being reduced to a single idol with clay balls. That's funny. But she also means that how horrible for an actual man to be reduced to this one thing. So if it's all about the phallus, on the one hand, women are told to worship the phallus, and, but you don't have one, and that's horrible. But it's horrible also for men to be told that this one thing is what constitutes their entire personhood. How horrible for men to be reduced to that. It's scarcely enviable. Um, <clears throat> How, I'm skipping sentences here, um, an unenviable destiny. So it's bad for men to be reduced to that and consumed, as Freud and his followers note, by a fear of being a woman. For if psychoanalysis was constituted from woman to repress femininity and not so successful a repression at that, men have made it clear which means we're still afraid of, they are still afraid of castration. Its account of masculine sexuality is now hardly refutable, as with all the human sciences, it reproduces the masculine view of which it is one of the effects. What she means here is that if we talk about the symbolic order or psychoanalysis, all we're doing is going in circles where men are afraid to be women. So when we talked about Mulvey, we talked about the fear of castration driving men. She's saying the same thing. How horrible to be reduced to this one version of the phallus and all you are worried about is having it cut off and that all of psychoanalysis revolves around this fear and that that's bad for men also. Okay. Um, she talks specifically about the dark continent again, and um, then about uh, the Medusa. She says, um, this is the top left-hand side of 995. Oh, dear. Um, <clears throat> uh, because they, men, want to make us believe that what interests us is, in, is the white continent with its monuments to lack, the white continent here being men, lack being women, lacking a phallus, and we believed, and we believed, they riveted us between two horrifying myths, between the Medusa and the abyss. That would be enough to set half the world laughing, except it's still going on. She goes on to say it's still going on. And then about men, too bad for them if they fall apart upon discovering that women aren't men, if they are castrated, or that the mother doesn't have one. But isn't this fear convenient for them? Wouldn't the worst be, isn't the worst in truth that women aren't castrated? that they have only to stop listening to the sirens, for the sirens were men, for history to change its meaning. You only have to look at the Medusa straight on to see her, and she's not deadly. She's beautiful, and she's laughing. And this is what happens, she's saying, if women can look at the Medusa not from the perspective of men, from Freud. 
Okay. Skipping ahead to um, 998, I'll just point out on the right hand side, the bottom of 998, there's a reference to Shklovsky, which should make you feel quite smart. At the top of that right hand side of 998, she says, um, Undeniably, we verify it at our own expense, but also to our own amusement. It's their business to let us know that they're getting a hard on so that we'll assure them we, the maternal mistresses of their little pocket signifier, that they still can, that it's still there, that men structure themselves only by being fitted with a feather. Okay that men have to just by virtue of castration and also by virtue of being, I suppose, like uh, opposite and even in the imaginary, reassuring men that yes, you still have a phallus or a pocket signifier. Um, she then starts talking about pregnant, um, pregnancy, and she talks about this on and off throughout the essay, but I may as well talk about it here. She did before when she was talking about the mother. Um, she talks about the ta ta taboo of the pregnant woman, and she talks about it in this way where she doesn't say it quite this explicitly, but she says basically, I don't lack anything. The imaginary is infinite. I have access to language independent of your phallus and I'm not lacking, I'm not castrated. I can make people, I overflow, I bleed, I produce milk, I uh, make people, I laugh, I smile. And this is not the symbol of lack or castration. This is, a, this is, a, this is an actual thing, not a lack of a thing independent of whether I have children or don't or, um, but if we're configuring womanhood, that's much more, um, much more the experience of women's bodies than whatever Freud or Lacan would have it be. She says again on the right hand side of 99, um, um, I don't want a penis to decorate my body with. That's, she doesn't have penis envy, but I do desire the other for the other, whole and entire, male or female, because living means wanting everything. That is everything that lives and wanting it alive. Castration, let others toy with it. What's a desire originating from a lack? A pretty meager desire. She's saying here in great sympathy with men um, that she wants all of us to desire everything, that it shouldn't be that women have this, it's not true that women have this desire originating from lack. Women have desire because women's bodies desire. And it ought not be true that men's desire originates from this very, um, phallus, this very localized place, transcendental signified, but that men can have everything also. She wants, um, she desires the other for the other, whole and entire, male or female. This is the bisexuality that she's talking about. Um, okay. On the last page, she mentions, um, on, and this is the second paragraph on the left-hand side of 1000. Beware, my friend, of the signifier that would take you back to the authority of a signified. She's talking about the transcendental signified there, which would be the phallus in psychoanalytic terms. Um, and then at the bottom of the page, uh, left-hand side, she says, in the big other love, in the beginning are our differences. The new love dares for the other, wants the other, makes dizzying, precipitous flights between knowledge and invention. The woman arriving over and over again does not stand still. She's everywhere, she exchanges. She is the desire that gives. 
she's also making a reference here to multiple orgasms that women are a desire that is recurring. She's basically saying that women's bodies are overflowing and this is true in psychoanalytic and she's arguing against traditional psychoanalytic terms and encouraging women to write from this overflowing body. I hope you love it. I hope you love it a lot. Okay. I'll see you Wednesday.